Thank you very much, David. Good morning again. So I just have to say, like, Eric uh, Padron at Moffitt was looking for controls to do sequencing. So I volunteered. So I know that I don't have any, any mutation at age of 45 <laughs> below the, above the VAF of 2%. So I'll probably recheck in five years again. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, my, my thing, my talk will be really talking about approach and MDS management. And it's probably the part where we summarize where are we currently in, in management. And my disclaimer is like probably part of this is what I do, and it could be argued that it's probably not the best way. Uh, my program director during fellowship usually used to tell me all the time, you know, like, you know, you try to practice evidence base as much as you can, but at the end you'll always have a patient in the room that you have to take care of. So that's where the art of medicine is. So some of this may not be a level one evidence base, but that's how I do things. All right. So. Like, in, in the way they approach how to manage MDS, you know, I, I spend time and I tell the fellows all the time that there are three steps in any type of disease we manage. First, we have to make sure that the diagnosis is right. Then we risk stratify the patients, and then we manage the patients. And that's what I'm going to try to cover through this. So, you know, what, most of the cases that we see are referred to as that there is cytopenia, there is suspicion of MDS. Uh, and we do have kind of what we de developed as MDS clinical pathways. And this is the diagnostic workup that we do for our patients. So obviously there is some workup that would be done for patients that are suspected to have MDS. Then once the diagnosis is confirmed, we do some more testing. And to David's point, I think, you know, a myeloid panel actually should be nowadays incorporated in, in the patient's, you know, workup, uh, especially once the diagnosis is confirmed or if there is suspicion for the diagnosis. I have to say, like, uh, we always have been testing for FISH uh, MDS panel. I think most of the places do them. Probably the utility of the FISH MDS panel is much less than the NGS sequencing. Uh, Gar Guillermo Garcia Manero presented some data at ASCO, and we actually looked at our also institution data. Uh, you know, the, the rate of detecting abnormalities on FISH MDS is probably like 3% in patients that have normal karyotype, we'll, where it's going to be much higher with like next generation sequencing. Uh, so we obviously get the basic lab workup, we rule out nutritional deficiencies, we get a bone marrow on everybody, cytogenetics. At our place, we do get uh, a myeloid panel. We use our internal one, which is 54 genes. I, I really always like look, look into other things. Um, in older patients, there are some few things that could mimic MDS. We've had f several or few cases of like LGL that could present like MDS. Uh, so in, in older patients, maybe sometimes if it's not clear MDS, it's worth looking for LGL. Uh, in younger patients, or if there is evidence of hemolysis, uh, it's worthwhile checking for PNH. <coughs> we used to do PNH on every patient. The yield is probably very low, unless you see some low haptoglobin and hemolysis. I don't think it's worth checking on every patient. And even if you see those minute clones, I'm not sure what to do with them. So once we establish a diagnosis, and I, as I said, like it's very important to, to really spend some time making sure you have the right diagnosis. Sometimes it's not easy. Uh, in the extreme cases, I've seen patients diagnosed as MDS and got treatment for a year, and all what they had is iron deficiency anemia, unfortunately. And we've seen cases where it's clear MDS and, and no treatment was offered to the patient. Uh, there is some uh, literature also suggesting, like in tertiary centers, when they review pathology for those patients in around 20% of the cases, the diagnosis is changed, either upstaged or cases were missed as MDS. So once we make the diagnosis, the next step is really risk stratification for the patients because you are going to tailor the treatment based on that. And in reality, we don't have many options. We are always thinking of allogeneic stem cell transplant. So we are trying to get to gauge the risk of the disease versus the risk of the procedure. And there are several models used for risk stratification in MDS uh, clinically. Uh, probably the most accepted is still the uh, IPSS or its revised version, the revised IPSS, that definitely uh, refines the uh, prognostic value of the IPSS. At our place, actually, we calculate every single risk model. When I have a fellow in the clinic, it's easy to do that. But in real life, probably it's you know re reasonable to stick to one, and probably the revised IPSS is the most commonly used, integrated in the NCCN guidelines. And it's the same variables that we use for the IPSS, the myeloblast percentage, the karyotype, in much more detailed uh, subtypes or categories. And it accounts for the depth of cytopenia. You end you know, classifying the patients in one of five risk groups, the very low, low, 
intermediate, high, and very high. So this intermediate is a new one that we did not have with the IPSS. So the very low and low, like I think everybody treats as a lower risk, the high and the very high, everybody treats as higher risk. The intermediate, I think that's where we individualize the treatment for those patients based on other variables, patient age, and so forth. Now, you can also complement the clinical models by looking at the uh, somatic gene mutations. So this is, again, you've heard about this from uh, David Salmon yesterday, and many people alluded to this. Uh, like, there are several genes that are predictive of outcome, and that's true even when you complement the revised IPSS with some of those genes. So a mutation on the P53, P53 or SXL1 will upstage the patient risk. Uh, what we don't know really, like, you know, does the treatment we offer for those patients. So if I upstage a patient and say somebody was intermediate and they have a mutation and they are higher risk now, if we treat them with hypomethylating agents, are we altering the natural history? Or if we offer them transplant, does transplant overcome some of those somatic mutations, poor prognostic value? Those are questions probably not answered, but we still have to make some clinical decisions when we are seeing patients. So this is how I look at the risk. So once I see the patients, you know, we look at the revised IPSS and we look at the somatic mutations, and we divide the patients into three groups, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the, 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 the ugly really are like the P53 mutations, uh, monosomal karyotype, complex karyotype, they're very high and high risk. All those patients we are talking, unfortunately, about the median survival, sometimes less than a year. The, the very good risk or the very low risk are those patients that have very low risk by revised IPSS, plus minus one somatic mutations, the low risk with no somatic mutations, and those patients that have a low, very low uh, risk or intermediate risk and have only SF3B1 mutation, which is the only somatic mutation in MDS that's associated with favorable outcome. And the rest will be in that intermediate risk group. So the ones we classify as lower risk, we go stepwise in management. The ones that are higher risk, we think of transplant for them. The ones that are in between those intermediate, I think you individualize the treatment for those patients. So if we label the patient lower risk, I think the first question is, does the patient need treatment? Because I don't think there is evidence now until now that we, if we intervene earlier, will alter the natural history for those patients. And in 80% of the patients, when we treat lower risk, we are treating for anemia. There are rare circumstances where we treat for severe thrombocytopenia in a true lower risk MDS, and m more rare probably to treat for like neutropenia. And, and for neutropenia, actually I've seen this many times that people get, patients get treated with azacitidine for isolated neutropenia, which really, if you look at the studies, the response rates were not better than conventional care or best supportive care. It's like 19% response uh, for neutrophil response on those studies. And many of those patients actually would not have any recurrent infections or indication to treat. So if a patient hemoglobin is 11 or 10.5, and I saw consult Thursday before coming here, patient hemoglobin 11, SF3B1, very low risk, and the you know community doctor is going by the you know, just the NCCN guidelines saying this is very low risk MDS, cytopenia, offering the patient is a cytidine therapy. Um, and in, in my mind, if patient is asymptomatic, no, you know, severe cytopenias, there is really no indication for treat, so one could observe. If the patient is anemic to a point that they are symptomatic or they are transfusion dependent, one would start thinking of treatment. So again, in the lower risk, in 80% of the cases, we are treating for anemia. So if somebody is, there is no really magic threshold or cutoff where I'd say, like, I would start treatment. You know, most people, when they are below, like, nine or eight hemoglobin, they are symptomatic. So if the patients are symptomatic, sometimes I even try to give the patients one-time blood transfusion and see if they feel difference, and then I'll start treatment. But most of the time, I think, when their hemoglobin is below 10, we start thinking of treatment. So if patients have anemia, the first step is considering erythroid-stimulating agents. And you can use some risk models to predict the response rate to uh, erythroid stimulating agents. And this is whether you are using uh, erythropoietin procrit, short acting, or long acting. It's probably do those dependent or those matter. Like we use more uh, procrit in our institution. Um, you could start, the starting dose is also like 40,000 and you go up to 60,000, different from what's used for anemia of renal failure, for example. And that's another thing. We see patients on suboptimal doses of uh, erythroid stimulating agents. 
But if patients' endogenous serum EPO level is more than 500, or if they are like heavily transfusion dependent, or at more than two units even per month, their chances of response to erythroid stimulating agents is probably less than 10%. And even if a trial is attempted, like it should be probably short lived, and then the erythroid stimulating agents should be discontinued at one point and not continued through all the patient lines of therapy after that. Now, there is some work recently looking at value of somatic mutations and predicting response to ESA. Uh, so those patients that have more than two mutations actually had lower response rates to erythroid stimulating agents. And it seems also presence of somatic mutations was predictive of outcome in those patients uh, in terms of survival even for those patients. So again, how to to incorporate that data is not clear yet, but it seems, you know, if you see patients with multiple somatic mutations, their response rates to ESAs will be less. So if the patients responded to ESA, we usually continue. The average duration is probably 18 months of response. If patients had somewhere between 8 to 12 weeks probably of an ASA trial and there is no response, it's reasonable to move to the next step, especially again if the patients are symptomatic or transfusion dependent. So the next step is really in my mind to think do they have a deletion 5Q or they don't have deletion 5Q. So if they have deletion 5Q plus at least plus minus one other abnormality, not higher risk, uh, and not part of a complex karyotype, uh, and not probably including the monosomy 7, because even in the WHO, like you could call deletion 5Q with any additional abnormality except the chromosome 7. So if, if they really don't have a higher risk, then lenalidomide is probably the next line of therapy for those patients. What we do at our place a little bit different is we look at the P53 uh, uh, in, in patients with deletion 5Q, because around 10 to 20 percent of those could harbor P53 mutation. Those that have really high allele burden, uh, we could consider hypomethylating agents and moving them to transplant earlier. Uh, those that have P53 with, you know, less, you know, with VAF of less than 20 percent, sometimes we've done uh, anecdotally adding DEX on a weekly basis because it can suppress the P53. This is based on a very small series that we did, like 10 patients of that lost response to nilidomide, we added DEX weekly and we, you know, gained response back in almost four or five of them for variable duration. No change in the clone or anything, it's just suppression of the P53. So this is really more like anecdotal uh, kind of our approach for things, but the standard for patients with deletion 5Q is uh, lenalidomide. And I think we'll hear the next talk more about uh, use of lenalidomide in MDS, but this is based on, you know, the MDS-003 and 004 studies where use of lenalidomide in patients with lower risk, transfusion-dependent MDS yields almost 67 percent transfusion independency and around 50 percent cytogenetic response with a median duration of response of around three years. And if you look at those patients that receive lenalidomide, it seems that those patients that achieved transfusion independency and cytogenetic response had less AML progression. None of the studies looked at the survival as endpoint, but several you know, analyses after that comparing even cohorts of patients who are not treated with uh, lenalidomide would suggest that responders or treatment with lenalidomide may impact the natural history for the disease and improve the survival in patients with deletion 5Q. So as I mentioned, there is a small subset, like 10 to 20 percent of deletion 5Q patients that will have a P53 mutation, and unfortunately those patients don't do as well. Although you could see hematological responses with nanidomide, uh, the cytogenetic responses are less, and mo most of the patients that progress you know, to AML are those ones that harbor the P53 mutation, even with the isolated deletion 5Q. So if the patients don't have the deletion 5Q, then the next question we ask in our practice is how old is the patient, like how long has the MDS been going on? So those patients that are young, below age of 60, or they are within the first two or three years of diagnosis, we really are on the camp of thinking of immunosuppressive therapy for those patients, treating them like we treat aplastic anemia with ATG uh, cyclosporin. Uh, again, in the NIH studies, the uh, most Predictable, predictable uh, in multivariable analysis, what predicted response to immunosuppressive therapy was age, uh, short duration of red blood cell transfusion. Uh, so for those patients that are young, that they are early in their disease, we do consider ATG cyclosporin. For the others, I think the options are going to be either lenalidomide 
plus minus EPO or azacitidine for those patients. I usually start with LAN EPO if they are purely anemic, then go to azacitidine. If they have significant thrombocytopenia or neutropenia, then I will go with hypomethylating agent. We try to look at the sequence of those treatments, at least if we were using lenalidomide or aza alone. If LAN was used after aza, the response rate were much less. If LAN was first line, the responses were higher a little bit. So for immunosuppressive therapy, uh, in our play, again, like as I mentioned, the, the most robust data from the NIH suggests that age, HLIDR15, and duration of transfusion dependency is what predicts response. So the guidelines say patients that are less than 60, especially if they are HLIDR15, uh, uh, they should be considered for treatment with ATG cyclosporin. In our experience, also what matters is where they are in their disease. Like when we look at those patients that had MDS for more than two or three years, the chances of response becomes much less significant, which makes sense that immune derangement or inflammation, as was mentioned yesterday in many of the talks, are probably early event. And if you get to a patient that are totally clonal and their disease is evolving, they are probably unlikely to respond to that. What we tried to look at also is like the impact of somatic gene mutations among those patients. So we sequenced uh, almost, I think, 40 of 66 patients that we've treated uh, with immunosuppressive therapy, and we were able to detect at least one mutation in almost half of those patients. And in general, absence of mutations, you know, predicted higher response or a trend at least for a higher response and a longer duration. Uh, what we also found that those patients that had the SF3B1 mutation, uh, only one out of nine patients responded to immunosuppressive therapy. And when I went and looked back at presence of ring syndroblast, it was almost like a mirror image that those patients that had ring syndroblast had less responses to immunosuppressive therapy. And the, in, in those patients that had, you know, no mutations, the rate of ML transformation was less. So in our place, if patients are on the younger side, their disease is early, they don't have, you know, several mutations or they don't have mutations, no SF3B1, we would consider ATG cyclosporin. Response rates could be more than 50% and durable. And it's one of the few treatments that actually one could get trilineage responses in terms of neutropenia and platelet response if that's needed. But again, it's a very low risk population. And again, probably less than 5% of the MDS patients will end getting ATG cyclosporin. Now, lenalidomide uh, had been used outside the deletion 5Q setting and non-deletion 5Q. The response rates are less. They are in the range of 25%. Uh, the, I usually use it if patients are purely anemic, uh, no significant thrombocytopenia or neutropenia. Now, recently we heard from Dr. List at uh, past ASH about the uh, intergroup study where they randomized patients with non-deletion 5Q, lower risk MDS, between lenalidomide versus lenalidomide plus uh, erythropoietin, uh, looking at the uh, major erythroid response in those patients. And what they reported that the rate of uh, hematological improvement or major erythroid response was higher in patients that got the combination. So uh, the, the thinking behind this that you know, uh, LEN and EPO could potentiate the signaling through the EPO pathway, uh, erythropoietin receptor pathway. Several years ago, we looked at patients that had you know, EPO failure uh, or ASA failure, lenalidomide failure as monotherapy, and when we did the combination, we saw around 10 to 20 percent response rate. So this was the basis for this study. The French group also had done similar study that they showed that the response rates are higher uh, in the combination. Some of the criticism is that the low response rate on the LEN uh, arm alone being only 14 percent, but those were actually a little bit more strict criteria than the IWG2 uh, criteria. What was interesting to me is to see that those patients that got the combination, that the duration of response seemed to be longer. Because what's been reported with lenalidomide alone in non-deletion 5Q lower risk is somewhere around 40, 48 weeks duration of response. And in this study, the ones that got the combination and responded, it seemed they had more duration of response uh, in the combination. So I think it's reasonable in patients that are non-deletion 5Q, if they are purely anemic and one is considering lenalidomide, is to consider the combination of uh, lenalidomide uh, plus erythroid stimulating agent. Now, azacitidine, again, I think at one point was one of the most commonly used uh, treatments for the lower risk. Uh, there was a time that patients were just immediately going to receive uh, uh, hypomethylating agents, even from time of diagnosis. We learned that outcome of patients with lower risk MDS after HMA failure is also not good with a median survival of less than uh, 
you know, two years. I usually try to reserve use of hypomethylating agents for patients that are pancytopenic, that they have significant thrombocytopenia or neutropenias, or if I think that they are really having higher risk features or like to offer hypomethylating agents as last step in the management of lower risk. I feel comfortable treating patients with ESA, lenalidomide, if they are purely anemic, offering them clinical trials, actually, and then treating them with HMA, unless, again, there are, like, risk features that make me think the disease is higher risk, or they have significant cytopenias in terms of thrombocytopenia that need treatment. So the schedule in lower risk had been used most commonly is the five-day regimen based on this paper from Dr. Lyons and JCO showing that five days did not differ from 522 or 525 in terms of toxicity and that transfusion independency was similar. So most of the places use five-day regimen for the lower risk. Now, in the consortium, and you know, our colleagues at MD Anderson had pioneered this lower, uh, lower dose hypomethylating agents used, and I think the paper is out now in blood and looking at the first cohort, and we still have one ongoing randomized clinical trial trying to look at the optimal dose of hypomethylating agents in lower risk. Uh, and and the, the preliminary data in the first round of the uh, clinical studies, low-dose hypomethylating agents seem to be an uh, acceptable alternative. Uh, in this uh, study, they compared azacitidine versus decitabine three days, and it seems three days decitabine was better than uh, three days azacitidine, uh, high response rates and durable responses. So the study we have now in the consortium is asking two questions. One, the benefit of treating patients earlier, so patients could be randomized if they are not transfusion dependent to either observation or treatment with HMA, and they have to have some high risk features. Or if they are transfusion dependent, or if they had an event, even if they were on the observation arm, they will be crossed over to get treatment where they are randomized between three arms. Five days azacitidine, three days azacitidine, or three days uh, decitabine. So hopefully that study would answer a couple of questions. Is there benefit of earlier treatment? And is there better schedule or easier schedule for patients uh, to receive hypomethylating agents in the lower risk MDS? Now, when we move to the higher risk, uh, I think it gets a little bit probably there are like a couple of decisions one have to make. Like the first thing in mind is can we, you know, take those patients to transplant? You know, those patients have enough disease risk to justify the procedure, but is the risk of the transplant itself justified? So the first thing we actually look at nowadays in our place is we look if the patients have P53 mutation. And those that have high allele burden with P53 mutation, we use decitabine based on some data suggesting maybe that there is more clearance of the clone. Again, this is probably level four uh, evidence-based practice, but you know, we are trying to uh, generate some data or our own data also with that. Uh, if they don't have the P53 mutation, most likely we go with azacitidine, and we do consider those patients for uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant, um, and those that they don't go to transplant, we continue with hypomethylating agents. So transplant is obviously the only curative option for those patients. The way I discuss transplant with my patients, I would say, you know, this is the only curative option. I would tell them that, you know, you are weighing on risk versus benefit. In general, all over, the cure rates are probably around 30 to 40 percent. Um, we've transplanted around 400 patients at Moffitt. When I look at our patient population, we actually have around 20 percent that will live 10 years plus. So, like, but probably it's reasonable to say 30 to 40 percent, five years survival. Uh, with around 20% transplant-related mortality. So you are always weighing that benefit and risk. And I think what I try to explain to the patient is that is there is al almost a one-year quality of life lost or two years through the transplant. And you try to look at that margin of gain of benefit or gain of survival for those patients. So if somebody is 70 without MDS, they are probably expected to live to 80 or 85. So they have 10 to 15 years survival. With MDS, their survival is going to be two to three years. So they are really losing from the disease around seven to 10 years. And if they go to transplant, they lose two or three years. So the margin of benefit is like three to four years for somebody who's early 70s. And some patients would say, yes, I want to do that. Some patients will say, like, I'm not going to go through that process for two years for a margin of two years gain of survival. If somebody is younger, I think in my mind their margin of gain is, is much higher and we try to probably like more be aggressive in considering patients for transplant. The median survival actually comes almost the same whether the patients are transplanted or not uh, in general. So in the first, you know, for those patients, especially the older patients. So what had, you know, come clear that somatic mutations at time of transplant could dictate the outcome or, or like 
predict the prognosis for those patients. I think the one that's uniformly had been agreed upon is presence of p53 mutation at time of allogeneic stem cell transplant, where those patients' median uh, overall survival is less than a year with transplant. Uh, so I, I present this information to patients, and sometimes I, I wonder myself if it's ethically, you know, reasonable to push somebody to go to transplant or suggest transplant where I know that their median survival is going to be less than a year and their relapse is higher unless we really have a clinical trial or maintenance strategy. I think patients should know that information. Obviously, unfortunately, patients with P53 mutation don't do well with or without transplant. But again, to, to have patients undergo a transplant with the intensity of the procedure, uh, knowing that they have a very high chance of relapse is something I think about before recommending that for the patients. Now, for most patients, obviously, they go on azacitidine. Uh, we know the data, the AZA001 suggested around two years median survival. In real life, uh, nobody had been able to replicate that. Actually, Amr uh, Zidane, who's in the room here in the back, published just recently a call for like trying to put patients on clinical trial because in the real life data, most of the time, we are talking about somewhere between 12 to 19 months survival for higher risk patients with hypomethylating agents. And we definitely need uh, more improvement and have room for for more improvement there. I'll skip through those. But basically, we treat patients for four to six cycles. We reevaluate the response. Anybody that have hematological improvement or better, we continue. Stable disease is very controversial. There is a subset of patients that have stable disease that their outcome will get better. Uh, but I look at stable disease in different ways. So if somebody is stable disease and they get transfusion once or twice a month, I think that's reasonable to continue treatment. But if I, like, I see patients that we call stable disease and they need platelets three times a week, I'm not sure really how much they are benefiting from that treatment. And I try to actually take those patients off and either get them to clinical trial or best supportive care because I'm not sure really what's the stable disease there. So we still see some of the obviously pitfalls using hypomethylating agents like stopping too early. I've seen several patients that get into complete response, which we probably achieve in 10 to 20 percent max, and then the community doctors will stop the treatment because the original studies were based on six cycles and then stop. When you lose the response, most of the time you cannot get it. Um, we see a lot of you, a liberal use of growth factors along with hypomethylating agents. That's really not have been studied. I always worry about just liberal use of GCSF or GMCSF in the higher risk uh, MDS. If somebody has fibrin neutropenia or for short term, I think it's, it's okay to use them. We do use hypomethylating agents prior to transplant as a bridge. This is data from the French group looking at ASA versus uh, intensive chemotherapy, showing that those patients' uh, outcome is similar whether they got hypomethylating agents or intensive chemotherapy. Some would argue that you could take patients to transplant immediately if transplant is needed, that there is no evidence that treatment prior to transplant alters the outcome. I, I think that question had never been answered, and I think most of the patients that go to transplant early have like really less than 10% blast um, and have probably a favorable profile. If I have a patient with 15 or 20% blast and they have poor risk cytogenetics, I'm not sure that I'll feel comfortable just recommending for them to move to transplant without any treatment. And sometimes we come up with this maintenance after transplant. The, da the data are really very uh, scarce. There's uh, this paper from MD Anderson looking at azacitidine maintenance. They I, defined the dose as 32 milligrams. They gave the patients four cycles. And when they compared this to the retrospective or historical cohorts, they saw improvement in the overall survival at one and two years. We've treated off protocol, but in a prospective way, around 11 or 12 patients with maintenance post-transplant. And the median survival in our group was not reached, actually, for those that were on maintenance compared to, like, probably two years for those that did not get it. So I discuss it with patients. I tell them that, the, you know, it's based on a phase one study. Uh, and I usually sometimes use this principle of new adjuvant. So if the patient got azacitidine up front for transplant and they were in complete response, and then I would offer them you know, some consideration of maintenance. But if the patients were progressing or just had stable disease on hypomethylators prior to transplant, I'm not sure how much is there room for maintenance for those patients. Although transplanters suggest sometimes that the milieu could change and that, you know, AZA could be active, changing graft versus uh, leukemia effect after transplant, but that's what I do. And again, a randomized trial probably is warranted in looking at the maintenance role of uh, azacitidine or decitabine post-transplant. So decitabine, obviously, the original studies did not 
proof survival advantage for so for a long time we will have been using azacitidine preferentially until recently some you know data were suggesting that decitabine may be probably you know effective in clearance of p53 mutation uh, clones again it's not been compared to azacitidine, so it's really di very difficult to tell whether this is just decitabine. Uh, this New England paper by the Walsh U group by Dr. Welsh uh, got a lot of attention showing that patients that have P53 mutation did better. I think the clear message is that patients that have P53 mutation, they do better with hypomethylating agents than intensive chemotherapy. There is no doubt about that. The choice, whether it's decitabine or azacitidine, is better. I don't think it's clearly answered. But there are two papers suggesting that there is high rate of clearance of the P53 mutation with decitabine. Um, the, the response rates, it seems that you achieve higher CR rates uh, in, in P53 patients. But unfortunately, still the survival for those patients is, is poor. And this is again just from the paper showing that those patients, uh, that the P53 clearance uh, with decitabine, in this study they did at least the first course of therapy as 10 days regimen. Uh, that's something we've not been doing on a regular basis. And since this paper came, some of our patients had been treated with that uh, regimen. Uh, the interesting thing, if you look at the small number of patients that went to transplant, there were like seven patients with P53 mutation that went to transplant. Those that cleared the P53 mutation, it seems that their outcome was similar to those that did not have the P53 mutation. But again, this is a small number. Uh, it's, today, you know, because of lack of other evidence, like the way I look at this, if patients have P53 mutation, I'm considering transplant. I'll try my best to see if we can clear that P53 mutation clone before taking them to transplant. If they still have really significant VAF of P53 mutation, I'm very reluctant to take those patients to transplant knowing that their median survival is going to be measured in a few months. So there is some data also in, on azacitidine that you get higher CR rates, higher responses, but again, unfortunately, the median survival is, is the same for those patients. Now, we heard yesterday, again, a little bit about can we predict who are going to respond to hypomethylating agents. Uh, there have been several studies trying to look at molecular signatures of response. The one that stands out mostly is presence of TET2 mutation, absence of SXL1 mutation, that the response rates are higher. The way I looked at this all the time is basically, so what? Like, we don't have any other options, unfortunately, in higher risk MDS, so we are still going to offer those patients hypomethylating agents. Even if I know that the patient have 20 or 70 percent chance of response, we don't have any other options. Obviously, if we have a clinical trial, those patients that have lower chances of response should be offered clinical trial. But the, the other question is really looked like, can those patients, can we predict some patients that have more durable responses? So if I know a patient have a chance to stay on hypomethylating agents for three or four years, can I start questioning the optimal time of transplant for those patients? And this is work that uh, David Simon, again, at, uh, uh, at Moffitt did looking at that. And it seems that those patients that had the TET2 mutation while the SXL1 had more durable responses. Again, this needs to be validated in larger cohort, but... Those patients that were I'm on the fence, let's say I'm seeing somebody who's 72, and those patients are reluctant about transplant, myself I'm reluctant about transplant for them, and I see that they have that molecular profile that's suggestive that they could do well for two or three years on hypomethylating agents, I may start considering that. Again, this is probably a little bit leap of faith and needs to be validated more, but that's how I think we could incorporate those tools. It's one, predicting the response, but then the durability of response will always make us question the optimal timing of treatments we offer for those patients. So I think in, in summary, I would say that basically assuring accurate diagnosis and op uh, co obtaining comprehensive baseline workup is the first step in MDS management. Uh, accurate risk stratification will allow us tailoring the therapy for those patients. Uh, in the lower risk MDS, options are ESA, lenidomide, immunosuppressive therapy, and hypomethylating agents. Uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant is still the only curative option for higher risk MDS patients. And those patients with P53 mutation are probably better served with hypomethylating agents rather than intensive chemotherapy. And clinical trials is probably still probably the standard of care for most of our patients with MDS. I'll stop here, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions.